$31 billion worth of food is wasted every year in Canada, and that has food policy experts like Tamara Soma concerned about the health and sustainability of our country's food system. She's a PhD candidate in urban planning at the University of Toronto, but she was raised in West Java, Indonesia, and has seen the cost and consequences of rapid development on that country's food sector. What can Canada and Indonesia learn from each other to better manage food policy? Tamara Soma joins us now for that. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Now, what sparked your interest in food policy? Um, I've been a, a food advocacy and a food researcher uh, for eight years. And really, if I have to sum, up, sum it up in one word, is injustice. I saw injustice, um, and I saw that the, our global food system is unjust. Um, I remember during uh, my undergrad at, um, at uh, York University in my second year, I was watching this uh, documentary called Life in Debt. And I realized that the similar issues that were um, happening in Jamaica was also happening in Indonesia. Um, and so when I realized food um, it should be a basic human need, it is a basic human need and should be a basic right, but it's not treated that way. Um, it's actually treated as a privilege. So I'm privileged because I, have, um, I get to um, consume food three times a day. But this is not the case even in Canada for many indigenous communities and for other marginalized communities. So it's that, it's that um, issue of injustice that really sparked me in, in researching more about food policy. Um, I, I, that's really interesting when you say it's a privilege. It's mm -hmm. something that I've actually never thought about mm -hmm. in that way. Yeah, and, and th the fact is that um, for now, we don't have a Canadian food policy that treats food as a right, right? So um, if you go to up north, if you go up north in some of the reserves where um, communities in Nunavut are actually skipping meals because their average income um, cannot cover their, the average cost of food there. Their, the cost of food up north is three times or even more um, higher than Toronto. So again, it's, it's an issue of access, it's an issue of privilege. We're going to introduce a few terms for people, so we should start with a basic definition. Mm -hmm. What is food waste? How do you define food waste? There is not one definition that's agreed upon when you're trying to define food waste because it also depends on culture. But in general, when you're talking about food waste, it's usually divided into two components. So when food is wasted at the agricultural stage, that's called food loss. When food is wasted at the consumer stage, that's called food waste. And then um, at the consumer stage, it's then categorized into three further um, categories, right? So one is avoidable food waste, and that's, for example, if you make a lot of food and then you didn't get to eat it because you forgot about it, right? Um, so that's avoidable. Then there's the non-avoidable food waste. Non-avoidable food waste, an example of that would be um, eggshells or tea bags. So people will not eat that. Um, the possibly avoidable food waste, um, for example, would be bread crusts because some people would eat it and some people don't. But so where I originally came from in Indonesia, people used to eat chicken intestine, you know, or brains and other things like that. But that is considered food waste in other culture. So this is why we have a variety of um, terminology and definition for, for food waste. And what is food security? Um, food security is basically the ability to access nutritious, um, wholesome, and culturally appropriate food um, um, by people and by, by, by the community. And how is food security and food waste connected? Um, it's very interesting, actually. It, the connection, so it's very interconnected. Because if you think about it, like, let's take the Canadian context, right? We have $31 billion worth of food waste, but then we have a million, close to a million Canadians requiring access to a food bank just to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, university-based food banks are seeing an increase in uh, students or families of these students coming in just to make you know, just to supplement their, their meal through food banks. So what you have is, you have um, an issue in, in one sense where in Canada we have $31 billion worth of uh, food waste, but then you have another issue where there's actually a lot of people that are hungry. It's connected because there's a, um, a, a lack of proper distribution of food. And because as I mentioned in the beginning that um, food is seen as a privilege, so mm -hmm. only those with income and access to the market can actually obtain food, but it's not, a, it's not seen as a right, where everybody, regardless of race, gender, income, should be able to access that food. And people from outside of Canada looking in would mm -hmm. think that Canada is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Absolutely. How can people not have access to food? Mm -hmm. um, compared to Indonesia, uh, what can Canadians learn 
from the food policy there? Well, um, you know, there's a lot of issue in Indonesia, especially as it relates to food insecurity, mm -hmm. poverty, and hunger, malnutrition. However, the local food infrastructure in Indonesia is still alive. Mm -hmm. We still have a lot of middle-scale markets. We have the wet markets um, that sell local food. We have small, mobile, independent vegetable vendors. So these, these vendors um, sell local food, and then they go to each family. It's not all multinational supermarkets, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, Canadians right, right now are they're, they're experiencing a reverse trend. Mm -hmm. You have a renaissance of farmers market. You have an increase in community garden and the interest to grow your own food. You also have you know food policy councils sprouting out across the country. Um, so the the thing is, um, Indonesia can learn from the Canadian experience by preserving their you know middle scale infrastructure. And Canada can learn from Indonesia by realizing that, you know, these initiatives, these farmer market initiatives, community garden initiatives should be supported by policy um, and promoted because it is, you know, it is creating a better impact for, for food system. And how has modernization changed how Indonesians waste food? Right. So, um, in the there's a traditional relationship um, between Indonesians and food because Indonesia is considered an agrarian nation, right? I don't know if I can tell you a story, mm -hmm, but um, so in Indonesia, there's this story, the uh, West Java, a Javanese story called the Tale of the Crying Rice. Mm -hmm. And in this story, basically a farmer um, was harvesting the rice and then she, after she finished, she heard a crying sound. Mm -hmm. So she looked all around and then she found that the source of the sound was this unharvested rice, you know? And, and so from that story, a lot of um, the, old, the older people, the elders would say to the children, eat all your rice or the rice will cry. And it's not saying that the rice actually cries, mm -hmm. but it's that emotional connection to the food, to the labor of the farmer. So that traditional emotion and relationship to food and to the farmer was significantly changed in the 1990s um, with the modernization of the food system. And this happened um, through structural adjustment policies. Um, they are basically policies that open up Indonesian market and in many other developing countries too, to foreign direct investment. So when uh, the market was open, you had an influx of foreign supermarkets, uh, foreign businesses that set up shop and then change the consumption landscape, right? You People were increasingly urbanized. A lot of peasants moved to the city. A lot of the prime agriculture lands were paved over. So agriculture, the, that close tie became, um, be, uh, slowly became detached from the people. And their first um, point of contact in terms of purchasing food is the supermarket. Mm -hmm. It's no longer the farmers and getting to know the farmer and like understanding the process of growing the food. And so, so, that, so that definitely created an impact in that loss of connection. So how do you think that the authorities in Indonesia have handled food waste? Um, I think that it has not been a priority. Um, so in Indonesia, like in many other developing countries actually, food waste Waste is a major component of the waste stream. Mm -hmm. um, in Bogor, the city where I am conducting my field work, 69% of the waste collected by a municipality is food waste. Mm -hmm. However, right now, what they're doing is they're, they have an open dumping system. An open dumping system is basically where you just throw um, organic and unorganic waste and there's no management. So there's no leachate management, there's no gas management, um, and it's basically piled into a mountain. And this is literally, it's dangerous, very dangerous, and it's a ticking time bomb. You also, um, I read an article where you said that one of the reasons why you wanted to um, focus on food policy was that because of, uh, you lost a, a family member. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that was also connected to this issue of food waste. Yeah, so um, I lost my nephew um, and he was three years old. Um, he, uh, his name is Arfan, mm -hmm. very cute, smart boy. Yeah. Um, and what happened is that he, he passed away from dengue fever. And the problem with dengue fever, so it's carried by mosquitoes, is that they live in, um, they live in anything where there's a container and then there's like stagnant water. So what happens with the waste, as you can see in the background, is that in Indonesia, as modernization occur and people are no longer wrapping food in banana leaves, they're changing it to styrofoam or plastic container, then you add that with the lack of waste infrastructure, a lot of people just 
throw everywhere, right? And so you have all these containers collecting rain because Bogor is called the rainy city, mm -hmm. right? So, so then the rain would fall, collected in the containers, and then it would get hot. And the mosquito larva would basically, um, it, it would, it, it, the mosquito will breed in the water. And then when the sun shines, then mm -hmm. they will just uh, start um, going out, right? And, and he, he died from, he died from dengue fever. And it, it, it's going to continue with the increase of urbanization and waste. And that would be the link between food waste and climate change? Um, the link between food waste and climate change is a little bit different mm -hmm. because food waste um, food waste um, contributes 7% to the global greenhouse gas emission. Um, so it has a very strong impact to food waste, uh, sorry, to climate change. And this is also because food waste, when it decomposes, it creates the greenhouse gas methane, which is 20 to 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So um, Really? Yes. So if you reduce food waste, you can also reduce the, the emission of the greenhouse uh, gas. And, 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 you know, help uh, alleviate this, uh, the whole climate change issue. Now, there was a landfill uh, explosion in Indonesia in yeah. 2015. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what happened? Um, so actually, the landfill explosion was in the year 2005. Mm -hmm. It was in a city called Bandung, the capital city of West Java. The landfill is called Louis Gajah Landfill. And of course, in the Louis Gajah Landfill, it's also open dumping just like in, in the other parts of Indonesia. And what happened was that um, because of open dumping, you know, um, there's no leachate and gas management. Now, the methane, when there's no rain, it would just kind of like um, create, it's combustible. So it would create fire, landfill fires. And there's often landfill fires in, in these open dump landfills. However, what happened in the case of Bandung was that for one day and one whole night, it just rained. And it created this compression, right? It created this, this pressure where the methane couldn't get out and literally exploded. And so if you're thinking about, if you think about mountain, snow mountain, this is a garbage mountain. And when the foundation shook, the, uh, there was a garbage avalanche, which killed 157 people and, two, and flattened two villages. And these two villages were located one kilometer, kilometer away from the top of this garbage mountain. And nothing has really been done. No, nothing serious has been so done. So potentially that could happen again. Absolutely. How Absolutely. common are these type of explosions? Um, well, not necessarily the explosion, but the landfill avalanches uh, are quite common because you don't have a structure. It's, it's just piled rubbish. So they, they have lots of different mountains, mm -hmm. basically mountains of garbage that's not flattened. Or, you know, here we have a sanitary landfill, landfill system. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, pipes that deal with the leachate and the gas, the methane gas. And we also flatten the, the waste out, you know, so, so it's not unstable like a mountain. So it's, it's, it's bound to happen again. Um, we have some pictures that you mm. gave us from your research in Indonesia. Yes. Um, can you tell us uh, what we're looking at here? Um, so this picture is actually in a low-income community um, in Bogor. And that picture really shows the, that the burden of waste and the burden of food waste is felt more by the lower income community. Why? Because the waste in Indonesia, just like food is, mm -hmm. it's a privilege. It's not a right. So waste collection is a privilege. And if you can't afford to pay for waste collection, then tough luck. You don't get your waste picked up. And do they, so they have to live in the waste as well? They or? basically throw wherever there is open land. And if their house happens to be next to it, you know, it's, it's the, the attitude is Tough luck. So not only are they not getting enough food, food to eat, now their health is compromised because of the, the waste. conditions that they're living in. Right. And what um, so what happens with a lot of the low income communities that they, they resort to burning the waste, right? Mm -hmm. And again, this was okay when the waste was biodegradable, but now you have battery waste, you have toxic waste, rubber, plastic. And so they inhale this fume. And I was there when, you know, people were burning and I couldn't breathe and I was just there for one day. So, you know, the, just the fact that they're doing this, you know, constantly is very concerning. We have another picture to look at. Mm -hmm. um, can you show up, can you explain this picture for us, please? Sure, um, that's actually in um, one of my high income respondents. And what she did was she took the initiative to compost um, her waste. Um, traditionally in Indonesia, people used to dig holes. So they would dig a hole, they would put the food scrap and then bury it when it's full and then dig another hole. But because um, nobody, um, because of the waste infrastructure is poor, 
people have to take initiative. So if they do care about the environment, they kind of ha they have to create their own composting system. And so this person was a, is an academic, and she's um, she's uh, very knowledgeable about uh, environmental issues. And so that's why she decided to um, set up uh, her own composting system in her house. But it's rare. And do you, uh, is the government trying to replicate that at all, or is this something that's... There's, on top of mind? Right, there's a pilot project in 13 um, different neighborhoods, but mm -hmm. again, it's, um, it all comes to priority, it co all comes to money, and um, it also comes to education, right? So um, they've started this in 2014 in, one, in, in 13 pilot neighborhoods, but um, again, we, we don't know what the impact of that would be. Okay, we have mm -hmm. another picture. Um, can uh, you tell us what's happening here? Okay, so this picture is actually the site, uh, you see the temporary dump, it's called the temporary dump site. And in Indonesia, a municipal government is only responsible for taking the waste from the temporary dump site to the landfill. They don't pick up, you know, in each house is like, like what we have so here So how does Canada. the garbage end up there? So what, uh, what they do in Indonesia is that they have some, you know, sometimes entrepreneurial people, private companies, or even low-income um, members of the community where they would offer their service um, to the middle class or the upper-income household and say, you know, I'll take your waste for you and you can just pay me per month. What happens in the city center? I'm assuming that you won't find garbage everywhere in the city center. You do. You do. You do find garbage. Um, it's in the gutter. Mm -hmm. um, it's in a lot of different places. I mean, in the touristy area, they mm -hmm. put more of an effort. Um, but again, it's not. It's unfortunately, it's not part of the priority. And the thing is that um, the, just the influx of packaging. Um, it's just so much. It's almost too much to handle if you can if you multiply that by the number of people living in Indonesia, in the urban center. We have another picture. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us what's happening here? Um, so. Um, this is actually a sad picture because mm. um, a part of my research uh, entails going with um, my respondents grocery shopping. So I would follow them around and then see what they're doing. But in this particular picture, and ironically, this was during the month of Ramadan, mm -hmm. um, where most Muslims are fasting, um, somebody decided to just throw this package of beef um, on the counter, um, uh, sorry, on the, in the candy aisle, because they decided that they don't want it anymore. Um, if you think about the amount of water, energy, and resources it takes to produce one beef, right? Mm -hmm. and, then when, um, and, and then for them to just kind of discard it, it's gonna be wasted because they're not gonna resell it again, right? Yeah. It's, 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 that, uh, it's basically demonstrating that whole disconnect, that detachment, because when, when you don't know how the animal is produced, when you don't know who produced it, it's easier to just discard it. And there's a huge chain of uh, people, things, resources, mm -hmm. that in order to get the cow to grow and right. be able to get to the point mm -hmm. it is, there's a lot of in lines the food, yeah, exactly. in the food chain. And that cow may not be from Indonesia, it might be from Brazil. And then if you think about the oil, that you know the oil of, of transporting that cow, you know, um, that that in itself is just such a waste. I've actually never even thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad we're speaking. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to see another picture. This one's a big graphic, so okay. viewer discretion advised. We actually touched yes. upon this earlier mm -hmm. in the conversation. Mm -hmm. In Canada, we're pretty skirmish about eating this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Is there a benefit to eating innards, brains? Uh, intestines? Well, um, it depends. Mm -hmm. um, if you're talking about health benefits, usually some of the offals are higher in cholesterol. However, there is um, there is a change, right? Because there, there are cultures, even in indigenous communities too, where you see the animal as a whole. So you utilize every single part of the animal, right? Here we're used to seeing like, you know, two chicken breasts packed in styrofoam and then you know, that's what that's what you get. Mm -hmm. But in Indonesia, there are still communities where they are eating the, whole, the entire part of the animal and, you know, even the chicken head, for mm -hmm. example. So it, it goes again to show that food waste is really in the eyes of the beholder. It's in the eyes of culture. I think in the Caribbean, they eat salmon head. Yeah. I, I'm from Uganda, oh. and we would eat um, the intestines, and we right. would even uh, eat, uh, fry the blood. Yeah. I mean, of course, right. I refuse to do that now yeah. because yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I guess I've got this Western mentality. Uh, we've got one last photo. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain to us what's happening in this picture, sure. please? Um, this is very harrowing. This mm -hmm. picture was actually taken in Bantar Gebang landfill in Bekasi, so it's near the capital city, Jakarta. But when you think of waste pickers, mm -hmm. you think of adults. Right? But actually, a lot of waste pickers are children. So just to bring um, a point, um, in, in Bogor, the mm -hmm. landfill where I, um, where the city where I did my field work, the landfill is over capacity. 
in 2005, but in 2014, it was still being used. Now, what happened was because, again, of that instability of the, the, the garbage mountain, mm -hmm. four waste pickers were killed. The youngest one was 11, his name was Wahyu, and the oldest one was only 14, Komarudin. Four kids, waste picker died. And it's, you know, and, and a lot of these kids are rummaging around through hospital syringes, through toxic electronic waste, and sometimes they're even consuming the food there, you know, because, you know, they have, they have to survive, they have to live. So the idea that kids at that age have to go through toxic garbage and, and then they die from the garbage and they consume the garbage is just, um, it's just horrific. Um, let's come full circle. We started our conversation talking about food waste in mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. Is there anything from your experience in Indonesia that can teach us about how we should approach the food chain here? Right. I think um, Indonesia is going in a path where we already went, right? Because our modernization of uh, and industrialization of the food system happened earlier on, like in the 19, in the 1916, right? When supermarkets were first invented. But in Indonesia, it happened in 1990s. And then within a decade, you're already seeing a change. But the thing is, if you do go to Indonesia, um, there is still the local infrastructure alive, right? It hasn't fully died off. And I think, you know, it's important actually for Canadians to, to talk to the, the government in Indonesia. So for researchers like me to say, you know, Canada, the US, we've gone through this kind of stage, mm -hmm. right? And many of us are turning back. Many of us are supporting urban agriculture now. Many of us are starting to think about planning cities with food consideration, you know? It's not perfect, but we're starting to think about it. Indonesia can't afford to go in that pattern that we went on because they, they have a lack of resources, financial resources, mm -hmm. and also they have a higher population. So the impact is it, it's just going to multiply. Is there anything in Canada that Canada is doing specifically that could be um, uh, applied in Indonesia that you would suggest the government there apply? I think um, there's some interesting thing. Well, maybe not in Canada, but in the US mm -hmm. where um, they are uh, reviving composting. And I think in Canada, there are some composting groups too, but it's reviving that knowledge of how to compost. Most Indonesians in my grandmother's age know how to compost, but that's not the case anymore. So knowing how to deal with food waste, knowing how to manage it and make it into a resource rather than a waste mm -hmm. is something that's beneficial. Now, I'm one of those people that <laughs> I kind of look at food as a chore and mm -hmm. I'm not really kind of like, you know, I throw out food and I don't really think about what it is that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, it just becomes garbage to me. Like, what do you say to people at home who are like me and to me, like yeah. how we should change, maybe think about things differently? I think we need to think of the food system as interconnected. A mango that you waste here, an Indonesian mango that you waste here, mm -hmm is the waste of all of the energy, resources, and labor in Indonesia. Uh, when we send off you know, cheap foods from North America to developing countries like in Jamaica, that wastes all of their harvest because the farmers there can't compete. So I think if we realize that we're all in this together, you know, food waste is a multi-scalar issue and it can't be solved just by one nation. It has to be solved by all of us working together, you know, making better policies that's fair for the farmers, for the farm workers, for the public. You know that 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 would be that would be a good step, but um, you know I do have tips too in terms of how we can reduce food waste. What do you think of the organic uh, system waste system? Oh, here in organic Toronto? waste system in Toronto. Yeah. Um, I think that it's definitely uh, a, a better step um, because we we have to source separate our waste. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's perfect yet because I don't think all do. Um, I, I know I live in an apartment building and I know that some people don't because I see them take their, their garbage and it's all mixed with their organic food waste. Um, I do, of course, you know, um, it's, it's very dear to my heart. But um, again, it's not universal, right? It's just in the city of Toronto. If I go to London, Ontario, they're not doing that. And the thing is also we're doing it at such a big scale that it's very easy for contamination to happen. So I think we need to support... What do you mean contamination? Like the waste can get contaminated? Yeah, so like when we're putting... Um, when we're source separating mm -hmm. organic waste, um, it's it's very easy if you're not uh, sure on what to put in the green bin um, to put things that's not supposed to be put in the green bin, right? Oh. Because it's such a large scale. But if if you revive the mid-scale composting system and revive that knowledge, a lot of the households can actually manage their compost in their own 
place. I mean, some people do vermicomposting in apartments, and that's pretty cool. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah, you use worms, basically, mm -hmm. and, um, and you get really rich um, compost that can be used for your garden. Now, recently, um, uh, the end of last year, mm -hmm. um, France became the first country to make it illegal for grocery stores to throw out unsold food, that right. food that can be used. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think that, uh, what, what do you think that impact is? Um, I'm cautiously optimistic about this law um, because while I think that it's commendable that the government is taking food waste, the food waste issue seriously, I think it's not addressing the root of the problem because supermarkets, um, you know, they, there's, a, there's an underlying problem of the economies of scale. Mm -hmm. The e economies of scale means that, you know, you buy more and then you buy it at a cheaper rate and then therefore you have a higher profit margin. But also because, you know, when people go to the supermarket, they want like this facade of abundance, right? If you go to a supermarket and you just see a few apples, it's, you, you feel that the supermarket probably doesn't have a lot of good food or a lot of fresh food. So we expect that pyramid of apples and the pyramids of oranges. Um, so my caution would be about this law is, is to not burden the charitable sector because um, the, uh, for the charitable sectors, they don't have the logistics. They don't have all the trucks and the storage and, and the freezing technology that supermarkets have. And if for example, you give a thousand containers of hummus that's going to go bad in three days. How are they supposed to manage that, right? So I think I'm cautiously optimistic because I think it's good that they're taking it seriously. But I think that you know before um, before creating such a policy, you really need to look at the charitable sector and look at their infrastructure and see whether or not you know this is the right way to go about it. Tamara Soma, I've learned so much from you today, and I am I promise to be more responsible. I really do. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for Nan. being on the agenda in the summer. Thank you. Best of everything that you do. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit tvo.org and make a tax deductible donation today.